Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mama Wears Athleisure. I am your host, Mariella de Santiago, a first time mom. We focus on all things mom with tips to help make life easier and more organized for all you mamas out there. Hi, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about autism and what it is. Hi, I'm Corey Yasuno. I'm the author of Autism with a Side of Sushi, a book I wrote about my journey being a mom of a son that is a high functioning autistic child. Thank you for that. So you mentioned that your son is on the spectrum. Can you share a little bit about your experience about when you learned of his diagnosis and what that was like? Part of writing the book was because I um, didn't know anything about autism until he was diagnosed. And I feel like that's kind of a little bit late in the game to find out about it. So my one of my goals is to try to have parents and um, adults and children, everybody be aware that you can have a kid on the spectrum and what it means before it happens. So basically what happened with us was that there were certain things that were not matching up to the other kids. What we noticed was like, uh, my son wouldn't respond to his name when I called him, didn't have joint attention. That's like when a kid wants to do something with you. So they want to show you something or they want to play with the toy with you or mom, look at this or look at that. Um, so there wasn't any of that. It was very individual play and it was also very, um, hyper-focused on certain things. And also just that one major thing of not responding when called. And so when we noticed all of these developments that were different than the other kids, his age, um, we went and asked I was talking about it actually with my sister-in-law, who's a pediatrician, and she specifically focused on the fact that he didn't respond to his name. And she said, you know, that's something you might want to get checked out. We live outside of DC, so we have so many people and so many um, experts in this area. So we were able to go talk to developmental pediatricians and um, talk to different doctors. And we basically had them run a whole bunch of tests um, to see what was going on. And we were um, right in that there was a developmental delay. He didn't start talking at the same time as the other kids. And later he was having issues with social interactions and making friends and sort of getting out of that parallel play mode was hard because he was fine playing by himself or next to a kid. But the social engagement part was missing. We were able to sort of notice these differences. They diagnosed it as a PDD-NOS, which is pervasive developmental delay, not otherwise specified. And I think it's a catch-all for like the younger kids. And he was really, he was like 18, 20 months when he was given that diagnosis, maybe two. Soon thereafter, it was very clear he was on the spectrum. And Wow. Thank you for sharing all of that. So I'm glad that you mentioned the age, how old he was when you guys learned all of this. Mm -hmm. So when would you say that you kind of started to notice some, some things that were probably not matching up to the developmental timelines that were given as parents? What I found was important was that I had joined this mother's group until then. I didn't have babies the same age as my son. I didn't have anything to compare them to. And, uh, and comparison is the root of all evil. So you probably shouldn't compare everything, but there were things that were pretty clear that that were different. I would say we started noticing like when babies start to point and Daniel wasn't doing that, that was like a cue. That was something, but again, you kind of have to see them all together to notice one baby not doing what the others are doing. So I think that helped me because since he was my first child, I didn't have any sort of experience being like, well, my other kid did this then. And having this mom's group and play group was great because I was able to see the differences in development. I joined that right away, probably when he was around six months, but I didn't really notice things until about a year 18 months and all the gross motor stuff he was doing fine like he rolled over at the same time he walked at the same time he crawled he did all of that it was more of these like subtle things that I noticed that were a little bit different so and I feel like as a mom you kind of get that gut feeling because you see three kids and they're all playing and like you clap they clap one doesn't you call their name and and all the other kids are reacting and then one isn't so in your gut you start to see a little bit of a difference whether you want to admit it to yourself or not and it took me a long time to admit it so i would say you know maybe as early as 18 months um but again all of this stuff is really hard to diagnose because when they're little little kids do 
weird thing. So it's not uncommon for a kid to not get diagnosed until second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, you know, and you could just think, oh, well, my kid is just a little quirky or my kid doesn't like to walk on grass and bare feet. You know, it could be just like a few random things or it could be something else. So there's really no answer because like we were talking about before, I mean, it's so different for every kid and every diagnosis looks different. But I feel like if you as a parent have a gut feeling and you feel like there might be something different, it can't ever hurt to go check it out because the worst that could happen is that you find out there's something going on and you work on it, right? And if there isn't something going on, then you're now reassured that there's nothing going on. So I feel like it's always better to just reassure yourself, go find out, ask questions um, and see where that gets you. And Or if you want to be in total denial, and that's totally fine too, because it's just keep all that stuff in mind. So when you're ready, then you can go find out more. We were talking about this earlier. So my background, special education, I've taught all grades from first through 12th grade. Uh, So autism does look so different for every kid. There's nothing that is similar, but there are three areas that we kind of tend to focus on that some students might all have a little bit of a disability in or a struggle in, right? So we have like one of them is communication. The other is the cognitive, which usually tends to be like the executive functioning or kind of how you also mentioned like the hyper attention or lack thereof and the social, right? Which is, it's seen in so many different ways. So it's hard to pinpoint right? if your child has this or lacks that, that yes. they might. <laughs> in your case, like with you did mention the um, like the clapping and the social aspect where your son wasn't interested in really engaging with others. That does tend to be a very common thing within kids that are in the, in the spectrum. And I say spectrum because we know that it's so massive. Yeah. <laughs> but with the communication, what were some things that you had noticed? So with communication, that was that was easier. So once well, you have to get to the age of communicating, right? So that's around two. But once you're two years old, you're putting two words together. I mean, that is an average. That is not a, a science, but that's sort of like a rough estimate. Our child didn't talk until he was like three or four, not putting two words together. But also there was a significant language delay in that our son was doing this thing called echolalia. And that's when he repeats your phrases back to you. So instead of saying, mama, uppy, which is what my younger one said, he would say, my uh, my kid on the spectrum would say, mama, you want to pick you up, pick you up, right? So he's repeating what I say to him. And so it's not pick me up, it's pick you up, pick you up, because obviously that was something I would say to him all the time. Hey, baby, want me to pick you up? And that's called echolalia. They echo what you say. That's a part, uh, a form of speech delay in that you learn the whole phrase as one word, not knowing like you want me to pick you up or all independent words that could be used different ways. And all of that was very similar. You know, all of the echoing of what I said. Um, Another thing that was very tricky for us to, to diagnose as a speech delay was his uncanny ability to memorize everything. In terms of his echolalia, like if we read him a book, he could repeat the whole book back. I thought, my kids have freaking genius. He can read, but he wasn't reading and he wasn't using words independently. He was just basically memorizing the whole entire book as a phrase or a song or whatever it was that he was doing. And so if you broke it all down, he didn't know what each of the words meant. And the last thing that was that it was, he was really hard for him to answer questions. My kid, if you said, what color is that? He couldn't answer because that assumes, you know, what the word color that or ball or whatever is. Now, if I had pointed to a color and said, this color is, he could finish the phrase because he knew that that was like a pattern and a phrase that you finish. So in all these little ways, like it was very clear at a very early age that he had a hard time communicating. We sort of did a lot of nonverbal communication because I stayed home and I spent so much time with him. So it was kind of hard for me to see it. I missed a lot of it because I just would just know what he wanted all the time. And then his lack of interest in trying to bring me into the fold was also, you know, wanting to share stuff with me, wanting to see what I was doing. There wasn't a lot of that interaction. So that was another area. I I like that you did mention like kind of the average, right? We look at as new moms, we get all of these milestones and 
they are helpful. They are a helpful guide, but the, you can't really use them too much and say, oh no, like my son didn't start crawling at seven or eight months or whatever it was because right. it varies so much. So that is kind of the same with kids that may have or show signs that are on the spectrum, but it is still really nice to be able to have a guide to follow that you can yeah. kind of start to keep track of it. If, if you do have some of those concerns and mm -hmm. talk to your pediatrician about it. So you mentioned that you are in the East coast. So you're close to DC and Maryland. Yep. You were in a pretty big area that mm -hmm. probably had a lot of resources. I know granted this was many years ago, but yeah. would you be willing to kind of share some of those resources and some early oh, sure. yeah, childhood yeah, yeah. things that were available to you as a new parent? When I was a parent a hundred years ago, no. <laughs> we didn't even have the internet back then. Um, actually, I don't know if we had Google back then. So there's always, well, in our county, we have a county program called Infants and Toddlers. And they are a program run through the county. It's free. You fill out a, a questionnaire and you tell uh, the county what your challenges your child is having. And then if you qualify, it's amazing. They send these people to your house that are trained to teach your kid how to start talking, speech and language pathologist, um, occupational therapist. They also have another program, and I'm sure every county has a different name, but ours was called PEP. It was like a parenting education program. And that too was a resource. If your county doesn't provide that, they have Obviously, there's a slew of private programs that one can look into. ABA, um, there's Montessori, you know, all these programs that are available. And I'm sure that they have specialists in their area. Your pediatrician is always a person to go to. Um, now you have podcasts, which has been amazing to learn more about this stuff. The internet, there's a lot of Facebook groups that I didn't have access to. But, you know, parents going through the same thing that can answer questions. As long as you don't really want like an expert in the field, there's other parents that you can reach out to because people are more open about it. Libraries have a ton of these uh, mommy and me programs and they too are aware of all the programs available. So there is a lot of resources out there. You just have to know how to get in touch with one avenue like one branch because one person always knows how to contact everybody else once we had that person we had everyone you really just need like one person who has got their foot in the network and then everything opens up to you and it could be a neighbor that might just know somebody you know so I would say just if you're comfortable in talking about it um, bring it up with somebody that you trust and see if they can guide you in the direction. And if it's not, I mean, it's just one phone call, right? Yeah. And there are so many resources available. There's also a, a big focus on making sure to provide some of those interventions early on. My sister is also a special ed teacher and she works with preschoolers mm -hmm. that have autism and providing those interventions early on so that they can develop the skills especially when they're in a larger classroom and know how to be a student in the classroom, which with hopefully, you know, any other peer and not in a separate classroom, that, that is eventually the goal, right? You want your child to be engaging with kids their age and not to have to be separated because they're unable to be part of the classroom setting. I'm glad that you just mentioned to be able to find one person that you can yeah. connect with that can open all of these doors for you. Is there anything else that you would like to share or anything that would be helpful for somebody that's questioning whether they need to look into whether their child has some of these signs? I didn't want to admit it for so long. I mean, not so long because we got Daniel diagnosed pretty quickly, but I remember feeling like there's really nothing wrong with my kid. Maybe, maybe he'll, maybe he's just going to get used to being, you know, responding to his name soon. It, it's fine. It's all going to work out. And I remember being in like kind of a denial period. But at the end of the day, I'm glad that at a certain point after I, you know, felt all of that and I realized that Daniel needed help, that once he was diagnosed, 
it's really easy to get stuck on the word autism. My kid is autistic and everything that that comes with that. But at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter if your kid is autistic or if it's called chicken pox or, you know, if he's colorblind or whatever, he still has or she will have certain things that he or she needs help working on. What has helped me is that I try not to worry about what it's called, but what we need to work on. Currently, it's the navigating the social skills and the social arena that is high school. I mean, imagine that's like terrifying and complicated. And how do I explain these very complicated social dynamics to a kid who really likes to see things in black and white and does not see perspective? I feel like it's really daunting and it can be very scary, but just bite off what you can chew and, you know, like, I try really not to stress about like what it's called or what other people think about it or any of that. Like I try to focus on this one thing at a time. And currently it's like, he is struggling with this one friend. Okay, fine. Let's just deal with that. Cause he would probably be struggling with the friend regardless of if he's autistic or not. And I think that's helps. That's helped me because I'm like a make a list and take action kind of person. So like, I can't really dwell on all the other noise. I just have to say, what do I need to work on next? And then just like figure out who I need to talk to and what I need to do and um, get that taken care of. And I think that hopefully that takes a lot of the anxiety away. But again, parenting is just like, you just don't know. You don't know if you're doing it right. You don't know if you're doing it wrong. You just hope and you're doing all that you can to raise a happy and healthy child. So it's tough, but I think that with support and with friends and with podcasts and with people that are so earnest and eager and wanting to help, it can be done. Ask for help and ask for accommodations and ask for, I mean, there's so much I could talk about. (laughs) I know because then it goes into like, you know, be an advocate and learn, teach your child how to also advocate for themselves. There's just so much. I get it because, you know, that's my background is special ed. I also did want to just kind of get a quick little synopsis of your book and share like a little bit of what your book is about, because I feel like that is uh, also sounds like it's something that would be super helpful for anyone that's interested. My book is called Autism with the Side of Sushi. And so I'm Japanese and I came to the States when I was five years old and everyone was like, oh, you're Japanese. Do you eat like sushi? Ew, that's so gross. Raw fish. (laughs) Right now it's so delicious, right? (laughs) Exactly. And now like those same people are like, oh my God, sushi is delicious. What I want to happen is autism, which is still kind of like a, what is it? I don't know much about it to become like sushi and like eventually be something that people respect and admire and accept and generalize. So that was the the thought behind the title and the book. And the book is really just about me and my struggles and my comedic attempts at trying to raise Daniel in this world that I was navigating. What I really wanted to do was write like a very funny book about all the crazy funny situations that we've been in but then as I was writing all these stories I was like well that was not that funny and that was actually kind of that's not funny so then it (laughs) turned into more of like a memoir but the reason why I say funny is because when someone tells you a really funny story you want to share that right you're going to be like oh my god I tell you this funniest thing that I heard today and for me the main goal is awareness and is like learning about my kid and autism after I've already had the kid and getting diagnosed is late. I want people to know about autism way before that. And now with one in 50 kids being on the spectrum, my goal is that if we can just all talk about it and tell like a really funny story that you read in my book, like you're never going to believe this kid did this being able to talk so comfortably about autism does so much good because it then raises awareness for autism in a positive light, you know, and it makes it easy to talk about. And I feel like once people start talking about it, that's when the awareness happens. And talking about it comfortably is when the awareness happens. And um, I wanted to create a book where people could just honestly talk about it. Some of it's funny. And I, well, I hope it's funny. And that it's okay to be like this normal mom who messes up all the time. But like, we're doing okay. And my kids in high school, and we're like, still 
still getting along somewhat most of the time. <laughs> right. So you don't need to be like a Temple Grandin or an Einstein or, you know, somebody super big and famous to, to be able to accomplish things. Like there's a lady out there in Maryland who's doing her best and she's doing okay. And you can do it too, you know? And that was the kind of like camaraderie that I'm, I'm going for because it is a hard topic to talk about. And sometimes I find it hard to talk about it depending on the mood I'm in or depending on the situation I'm in. And so that's why I'm really, really careful about saying like, if, if you're ready to talk about it, because some parents don't want to share their kid's diagnosis. And some parents like me are like, we wear it like a flag. We're like, yay. But all of it's okay because we're all kind of just struggling. And I feel like the more people are respectful of other people, then everyone's lives can only be better, I think. Thank you. Thanks for giving me a few minutes to share your background and your experience with this, because I know it is a hard topic to talk about for some people, but I think it's also a very important topic. And something that is so in front of us and we're not, a lot of people might not really understand it, especially like, again, because it's such a wide spectrum that it's so different from person to person, but just being able to kind of get a little bit of knowledge of like what it is and being more open and open to like understanding that goes a long way. And willing to talk about it. So read my book, <laughs> like that shameful plug, shameless plug. Thank but you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And reach out to me on social media. Like if you, you know, if you're a parent and you need to talk to somebody, like I am that somebody, I'm happy to talk to anybody. Um, let me know what you think. And, you know, and everybody can about anything, really. <laughs> Tell me what you like to eat. I don't know. <laughs> Thank so, you. Yeah, it was so nice to talk to you. I'm sorry, it's 20 minutes and That's... I hope you got all the nuggets that you needed in there. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Tune in next week for our next episode. You can find us on Instagram for more updates and tips. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts and give us a review if you like us.